Okay, well, I guess we missed our pledge being recorded, but otherwise, uh, good to go. So we are going to start off with some announcements this evening. And as we gear up for the start of the holiday season with Thanksgiving next Thursday, I wanted to start by reminding everyone who's eligible to please get your COVID-19 vaccine or booster and flu shot. These are our best protections against getting sick this holiday season and protecting our loved ones who may be immunocompromised or too young to get vaccinated. The good news, it's never been easier to get these vaccines. Most pharmacies offer flu shots, COVID-19 vaccines, and boosters. Our very own Austin Volunteer Ambulance Corps has COVID-19 vaccines and boosters available for both adults and children five years of age or older. OVAC is also partnering with Neighbors Link, the New York State Office for New Americans, and Northern Westchester Hospital in Mount Kisco for a children's vaccine clinic at, at Northern Westchester Hospital this Friday, November 19th, from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Walk-ins are welcome, but appointments are recommended. Call 914-666-3410 extension 222 to make an appointment. If you do plan on traveling to visit family for Thanksgiving, it is not a bad idea to get tested before and after traveling. OVAC also has free rapid, rapid testing available at their headquarters and many local pharmacies and healthcare providers offer testing as well. You can even purchase an at-home testing kit now, which is convenient for added precaution as you celebrate the holidays. Please, let's all do our part to try to stay safe as safe as possible and avoid post-holiday outbreaks. That's key for all of us so that we can continue to enjoy each other's company. Now for the, sun, the fun side of the holidays, holiday shopping. Make your plans to shop local this holiday season, and it will be extra fun this year with the Austin Small Business Saturday Scavenger Hunt. Pick up a scavenger hunt card at one of the participating businesses on Black Friday, November 26th or Small Business Saturday, November 27th while you are out shopping and you could win prizes from these great local spots. Participating businesses include Woods Bar and Grill, The Tasty Table, Westchester Cell Phone and Computer Repair, Shine Salon and Spa, Good Choice Kitchen, Sing Sing Kill Brewery, Mike Risco Music, De Martin's Barbershop, and Chilmark Wine and Liquor. We will be sharing on social media soon a proclamation making Saturday, November 27th, officially Small Business Saturday in the town of Osney. We have so many great local small businesses to support throughout the town of Osney. Please do so this year. Many small business owners have struggled throughout the pandemic, and when you shop small, you support your friends and neighbors. Gift cards, to restaurants or any of the services that we have. If you don't think that um, it looks like a gift shop, think again, it's a gift opportunity. There are also some great fairs scheduled in Austin over the next few weeks. This Friday, November 19th and Saturday, November 20th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Holbrook Cottage will host a festive fair to support the Austin Children's Center with treats, live music, shopping, and best of all, Photos with Santa. Yes, he made a very special trip from the North Pole just to come to support the Austin Children's Center. So you can't miss that. Start at Hallbrook Cottage and also head over to March Boutique and Wondrous Things for all the unique holiday gifts for your list. On Saturday, November 20th, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., the Northeast Etsy Collective will be holding their annual holiday artisan market at the Austin Public Library. A portion of the proceeds from this event will be going to the Friends of the Library. Also this Saturday, November 20th, and Sunday, November 21st, Bethany Arts Community will be hosting its Hudson River Potters annual show. Admission is free and the work of our very own Keith Gordon will be featured among others. Saturday's hours will be 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Sunday it's 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Visit hudsonriverpotters.net slash holiday show for more information. I don't know about you, but I think I may just be able to get close to wrapping up my holiday shopping this weekend with all of these great opportunities. I think I may be missing the, El the Elks Lodge. Does somebody have the details on that? Um, I think that they're hosting a, a gift just uh, just occurred to me. I don't know. Councilman Feldman, do you happen to know that? Uh, they are. I will look that up. Thank you. Okay. 
Also, we know there are so many who cannot afford gifts for their children or loved ones. We encourage you to participate in any or all of the many toy and gift and warm clothing drives that are taking place. Open Door is accepting toys through Thanksgiving at the Briarcliff Manor Public Library. They have a list of preferred gifts, which can be found on their website or through the link in my supervisor's update on the Town of Austin website. Also, Micro Esco Music is collecting new hats, gloves, scarves, and mittens at their shop and at the Tasty Table. And also for Councilwoman Feldman, I'm guessing the Austin Boat and Canoe Club is having their boxes out soon. And yep. um, please do consider purchasing some extra gifts for those who would otherwise be without while you are out and about. Did you wanna mention those two items, Councilwoman Feldman? Uh, okay, I don't have the Elks one yet, but um, the Osmond Boat and Canoe Club is indeed doing its holiday toy drive. Uh, the boxes will be out and about the day after Thanksgiving, um, possibly even sooner. I know that the toy shop, um, Penny and Ting, always takes one. The Risco Music Store always takes one, um, as do many other local businesses like Fred's Auto Repair um, and many others. So I will get a list together as they are placed and get back. But Fantastic. you can always go to obcc.org and uh, look at for the list yourself. Okay, great. Also, while you're out and about, um, you can donate turkeys to St. Anne's Rectory through this Friday. They accept them from nine to five. Um, and that would help with the Galata House annual Thanksgiving feast that they're preparing to serve at St. Anne's uh, on Sunday. And that's open to anybody who's interested. You just need to email Galata House uh, at gmail.org to let them know how many would like to attend this Sunday, November 21st from 1 to 4 p.m. Did I say Saturday? Sunday, November 21st, 1 to 4 p.m. That is it for me. And I know also Giving Tuesday is coming up. And I know that IFCA will be one of the participants and that's November 30th. So lots of opportunities wow. to give as we get. And did you find Elks? I did the Austin Elks Lodge Christmas Boutique, November 27th, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., 118 Croton Avenue. Handmade crafts, jewelry, gift ideas, stocking stuffers, Austin and crafts, and refreshments, and more. So again, that's November 27th, uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Right. So part of our, lo our, our shop local um, opportunity that weekend, just post Thanksgiving. Um, is there anybody else who has anything to add? For my board colleagues to our announcements. All right, hearing none, we have our work session agenda. And first up this evening is a departmental report from our recreation superintendent, Bill Garrison. Um, tonight, he's joined by Mike Garcia, our youth bureau director. So I'm going to turn it over to Bill and Mike for an update. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so just wanted to update people on some fall programming that we had going on. Um, one of the things that we have seen this fall is that uh, our programs, the interest in programs and registration has greatly increased and we are back to the numbers that we had in 2019 um, and, and actually even doing better than we were in 2019. Um, this past fall, we had disc golf going on. I know that was uh, something we had discussed in this meeting a number of times. We put a nine hole temporary golf course, disc golf course into Nelson and Nelson City Park. We offered some instruction for adults, um, kids and families, and we had a pretty good turnout. So uh, we're excited about that. We will be taking those uh, disc golf baskets down uh, within the next couple of weeks, but putting them back up again in the, uh, in the spring to try to spark that interest once again. Uh, we had another special event going on at Nelson Park that we did. Uh, we had the pumpkin patch uh, a few weeks ago, which was a success. We had uh, over 400 uh, kids register for that pumpkin patch. Uh, it was the first time we did it. Uh, we did this in lieu of the trunk or treat that's usually on Main Street. And uh, we are looking forward to next year because we came up with lots of great ideas how to make this event better. And hopefully we can still get back to the trunk or treat on Maine next year, but also hold this event as well. Um, many parents uh, really love this event. Uh, I was talking to one parent in particular who said that uh, she had five kids. She worked two jobs and she said she 
this was great because she did not have the time to head up north to go to a pumpkin patch with her family. And this was great because she was able to take all five of her kids over and have a great evening. And um, the, the PBA uh, was able to get um, cider and donuts donated. Um, so it was a good, it was a chilly, but a good evening. Um, the parks have been busy. Uh, the town and the village parks this past fall. Uh, JCYS baseball, um, Austin Little League football and cheer, and ASO soccer all using the fields as well as the town's uh, co-ed softball leagues. Um, the high school was used, uh, used Ryder Park for the cross country. Uh, they also used the community center for the girls varsity swimming. So uh, a whole lot of stuff going on um, in recreation and parks. Uh, we have a couple things coming up for recreation. One is our um, winter registration will open next Monday with programs starting in January. So we realize it's, a, it's always a tough time because of the Thanksgiving holiday and then the uh, holidays at the end of the month in December. So we open up the registration a little bit earlier than normal uh, to give people, but this is gonna give people about four to six weeks to register for the, the winter programs. And we've got a lot of things going on. Uh, so new programs we have is uh, Tango Tuesday, which is uh, a free program with your membership or it's $5 at the door. Uh, this is a program where you can go and learn to tango. It's Argentine Tango. Uh, they will have, we have two rooms. One is a beginner room where you will receive instruction and the other is more of a uh, intermediate room where you can watch and once you uh, start to learn, we can move up into that those different areas of dance. So um, that started uh, last evening. Um, I'm sorry, it starts last week, last Tuesday, they had a dry run. Uh, we had about 12 people at it. Uh, tonight is the first night of Tango Tuesday. And uh, we expect in close to 30 people there tonight uh, at the community center. Uh, we also Can have- Can we get uh, a little Zoom preview? Yeah, that would be, you know what? <laughs> ne next time. <laughs> Okay. Um, I can run up and take a video. I'm here. All yeah. right. That sounds good. Spy on us. See what happens. Uh, we also, um, we're going to have a tree lighting. It's going to be a live event. Uh, it's going to be a little toned down from past years. Just to give you a heads up, that's going to be on uh, December 3rd, Friday at 630. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of music by the Mike Briscoe Band, tree lighting and Santa, and then just a little opportunity for uh, kids to get their picture taken with Santa at Market Square. So that's uh, December 3rd at 630. Uh, let's see what else we got going on. We have basketball that's going on right now. Uh, we have nearly 100 kids signed up for all different levels of basketball, youth basketball I'm speaking about. Uh, we've got uh, more uh, men's basketball coming in. We've got volleyball going on. Pickleball has got over 50 people registered for it. So uh, all of our swim lessons are packed and booked. Um, we've added extra ones. We are actually, as of December 7th, going to be fully staffed at the rec center, which I'm very happy about. Uh, we have a new front desk person uh, and we have a lifeguard captain that will be starting on December 7th, who will be overseeing those, that lesson program, uh, the liaison with the P Patriots and the Spartan swim teams and uh, supervising the lifeguards in the evening. So all in all, things are good. I am just crossing my fingers now that uh, COVID doesn't raise its ugly head again and cause any more restrictions because the rec center is hopping right now. Um, and I'd like to keep it that way through the winter. Um, thank you. If anyone has any questions, Please let me know or comments or ideas. Are you still requiring mask wearing and um, or, or vaccinations required for any participation or? So we do require masks for all staff and uh, visitors to the community center, regardless of vaccination status. Uh, once you get to your activity um, and if you are uh, more than six feet away, you're, you're permitted to take your mask off if you are vaccinated. Um, and if you are participating in an activity like pickleball or anything else and you are vaccinated, you can also take your mask off. Uh, in our youth programs right now, because a lot of the youth are not vaccinated, 
we are requiring them to continue to wear masks during those programs. So basketball, for youth basketball this year, mask will be required for play. Uh, we realize that there are some kids that are getting their vaccinations now, but um, right now there's just not enough. We don't require proof of vaccination. It is on the honor system. Would it help if we worked on a pop-up for, for rec to try to do a vaccination program for youth with OVAC? Is that something that you considered or not? I, I, I don't know. I think the school is working on that. Um, I don't know, Mike, do you have any information on that from your well, talks with I can the school? Interject. Uh, so the neighbor's link, we actually gave out the flyers. We post the flyers here. Um, kids put it in their bags. I posted flyers tonight because there's a lot of parents here tonight for the basketball and the swimming that's going on. Um, and so um, several of the kids already said in the after school program that they were scheduled for shots. Actually, a kid was going after after school tonight to get a shot. So that is making movement. Um, I don't know if a pop up, I think maybe take a little while and see how it goes and then maybe plan for that. Yeah. Right. Well, we could definitely talk to, to Nick about doing something with Rex. So mm -hmm. Maybe that would be a good thing, especially on a busy night. Like, you know, that could be good. Could most be nights are busy. Most nights are busy right now, <laughs> which is, which is a great like thing. It. Sounds like yeah, it. It's, Fantastic. it's really going, it's really going well. Does anybody have questions for Bill before we go switch over to Mike? So Mike is our, Bill, do you want to introduce Mike? Sure. So um, Mike Garcia is the Youth Bureau Director. Um, Mike has been, had worked with the Recreation Department for uh, the previous 18 months doing some part-time work with doing Youth Bureau programs uh, with some grants that we had. Um, so it's been, a, Mike's been around for, although I think he just started officially in, was it? August end of 4th. August or September? What was it? August 4th. Yeah, August 4th. Um, he has been around a little bit longer than that. So um, we're very happy to have him. Um, Mike and I had, had worked together uh, previously at Children's Village for 18 years. So we've got a good working relationship. Uh, actually, Mike was my old boss. So uh, it's, been, uh, it's been great to be working with him again. And I know Mike is going to bring a lot of good stuff to the youth girls. So with that, Mike, uh, we'll look forward to your first presentation to the Town of Austin Board. Well, thank you. Um, it will be brief. Um, so I am very excited with the things that we've already been doing. Um, we've also been partnering with recreation and trying to figure out how do we support the programs, uh, working to support them, but also to improve the program that they already have. Um, so the Village of Austin, um, they passed and adopted the Youth Bureau. Um, and we're really working to connect youth to positive services and programs. And that's really the huge goal that we have. Um, that's the mission, that's the goal. Um, we've gotten some grants, um, even though uh, we were operating under grants before, we've gotten a grant from the White Plains, Friends of White Plains Youth Bureau for Grandpas United. Um, so we're gonna be replicating their Grandpas United program here in Austin, actually tomorrow morning is a virtual event from 9.30 to 10.30. It's a Zoom event uh, on Friday is going to be a coffee with grandpas um, at uh, Good Choice Kitchen. And then on Monday, an afternoon coffee with uh, First Village Coffee. So things will be going out through social media. I've sent them out through emails. So hopefully they get posted and the flyers and things get sent out as well um, through various uh, points. Um, Tonight, Mike, can you just, actually, I'm, Mike, I'm sorry, can you just maybe explain what the, the grandparents thing is and so okay. that maybe some people here might be able to help find some uh, okay. volunteers for this. I think that'd be important. So we're, we're replicating their program and basically it's a mentoring program for youth ages seven to 18, depending on the situation, because they're still sort of working out the details, but some will come through DSS, some may come through referral from the school. Some will come from the youth court. Um, several youth courts have been developed in Westchester and at White Plains is actually servicing most of them. Hopefully we can get the youth court up and running in, in the village of Osting so that we can then 
um, any kids who come through there can also participate um, through probation as well. So a lot of the kids that they have serviced so far through probation, but they're looking to expand it. And as they build their program, they're looking to do that. So various ways that the grandpas can help. It's basically going into the schools, having programs within the recreation department, within the community. Um, and, and really the grandpas sort of help guide what kinds of programs they wanna do with youth. Um, so we are recruiting. Um, so we're starting with the coffee with grandpas and then it's gonna take off from there. I mean, at the height of what White Plains Youth Bureau had, they had up to 70 grandpas and they started in 2018. Um, so tomorrow I'll do clear, a presentation. Just to be clear, you're looking for grandpas to mentor some of our youth. Yes. Do they get paired up directly with like one-on-one, -on -one, like grandpa X is paired with kid Y or is it? It's just a case by case. We're looking, we're probably going to do first start out with group mentoring because that's just the easiest way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then depending on the need, when it comes to youth that are being referred through DSS or through probation or the courts, it'll be a one-on-one. -on -one. Gotcha. But we'll have opportunities for group as well. And some grandpas will opt to only want to do group mentoring, which is fine. And we appreciate that. Um, others will say, well, I wanna do more and we can then pair them up individually. And it's so now with, grandpas with male, with young men specifically, or is it? They've done males and females, but we'll, we're taking the guidance of White Plains. And so we'll decide that when it comes time for it. We haven't gotten that far yet. Um, they're replicating the program. So we're, it's, a, it's been a slow process um, because they want to make sure that we do it right. The first thing is the recruitment of the grandpas. Gotcha. All right, so the grandpas would be doing stuff like fishing with grandpa or chess with grandpa or something like that? Multiple programs. You know, I mean, would they have, they, the, I know in White Plains, they have it, uh, grandpas go to school. And so they come in and they do reading with the kids for a period in school. They've done um, outdoor programs, sports with grandpa. Um, but because of COVID-19, everything's changed. So we'll have to sort of create programs that are appropriate and, and meet COVID-19 guidelines. Councilman Wilcher mentioned that after he retires from the town board, he's going to be spending his Tuesday nights dancing. So maybe dancing with grandpas. Um, just, we'll I'm just it tossing out. it out there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that, that's just one of the programs. Um, we're, if for the winter and uh, spring, we're working on a work readiness program. We're calling it Promoting Futures. And kids will have an opportunity to participate in workshops for work readiness, but also to have opportunities to work and do job shadow and get paid for those internships and shadow, um, which is a very different layout than we've ever had before. Um, and so the goal is to service a minimum of 15 youth. My goal is 30, but we're only required to do 15. Um, I think that from some of the feedback I've gotten so far, we'll probably meet that or exceed it. Um, that's the goal. Um, and a lot of the feedback I got from the community is that the kids need to have those basic skills of how to get and maintain a job. And so those are the workshops that we'll be covering for six week, two six week sessions that are going to be two hours a week. I mean, four hours a week, uh, two days a week. Um, so all of that information Bill mentioned about the catalog, all of that will be in the catalog when it goes live. Um, I mentioned grants. We've gotten the grants Grandpas United. The other is a legislative grant, which is the Sexual Risk and Avoidance um, Education Program. That's going to fund the work program and the, the mentoring. I mean, the, the uh, work internship program. Um, and so those are two programs that are definitely going to be the highlights to kick us off. Um, and then as we get more grants, we'll be sharing more information. Um, tonight, we, I actually took pictures of the program that's going on here tonight for the swimming and basketball. We have shirts that we're going to be giving them in backpacks once they get um, a little further into the process of uh, screening the basketball players. Um, and if you go to the Austin Youth Bureau on Instagram, you'll see what's going on tonight here. Um, you'll be able to see pictures and video of that. And am I correct? I believe you have youth advisory also as part of this. Right. 
so the youth advisory board is going to be developed. Um, we have to have a youth advisory board that will oversee and give guidance to what the youth bureau is actually doing. Um, it will have 10 members from the community, three from the village uh, board and two youth. Um, so we will be seeing those things coming out too, social media and emails. So we'll be sharing them with you, Dana, and you can send them out through your distribution. Um, and then hopefully by the end of January, beginning of February, we'll have the advisory board, at least the members, I, potential members identified, ready to go in front of the board. Fantastic. And we're also gonna need a, a youth board as well. That's, so that's kind a, of what the I council. Meant. Yeah, yep. youth council. The council we have, Council, we have a few kids on it already, and that'll be developed through the programs that we're running. Um, so we'll do recruitment for that as well. As I'm getting contacts with the school, I'm getting contacts with other organizations. Hopefully they will send kids um, to be a part of the youth council. Um, and then that will have full representation of the Austin community from all corners. Fantastic, sounds great. Uh, any questions from my board colleagues for, I guess, either Mike or for Bill? Um, any, any kids from throughout the community can take place in these programs, take part of these programs? Any youth. So the kids for the uh, Promoting Futures are ages 14 to 18. Um, Grandpa's United is 7 through 18. Okay. It's probably also important to note that all the youth borough programs are free. There's no charge for these youth borough programs. Great. Great. Well, I'm very excited about watching this get started and, and watching it grow. Thank you. So thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, and I also note that you've been involved in Communities That Care Coalition. Right. Um, and for Austin Communities That Care. So uh, I think that's great. And you know, we have a lot of amazing programs in the school that are targeting youth and hopefully the Youth Bureau can sort of be an overarching umbrella that um, pulls all the different good programs together in some kind of uniform fashion. I'm not saying, you know, not to replicate, but to uh, augment. And I think it's it's great that we that we have this in one of the, what is, I think it's like the newest Youth, the first youth bureau that's been started in, I don't know, right. 30, something like that in Westchester? Yes, so it's, so we're the first one to start new. Uh, Portchester and Yonkers actually are revamping theirs. <coughs> uh, they had, I guess they closed several years ago. So they're reopening theirs, but we are the first one to officially uh, be able to start um, and open in Westchester County. So you're here for that, fantastic. Again, just one time, one more loop around it. Anybody else have any questions or comments or anything from my board colleagues? They're gonna work in tandem with some of the other youth programs that we have in the community, right? Yes. Yeah, I've already partnered with a few of them. Um, I've been getting around meeting with people. Um, so that's sort of how I can learn what's going on in the community. Um, everyone has their own opinion about what needs to be done, but ultimately, you know, the youth advisory uh, the youth advisory board will help narrow down and give us more focus because they're going to be representative of the full community. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. thank you so much for that fantastic update. And sounds like you guys are keeping very, very busy and we're glad to hear that. And we're glad to hear that there are so many programs that are offered uh, throughout our community for recreation. It's awesome. Um, okay. So you guys are, you may leave or stay. We're always happy to have you join us for the rest of the meeting, but also if you want to leave, have a great night. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Next up, we have our town planner, Valerie Manastra from Nelson Pope and Voorhees. Uh, she's been helping us with our participation in the Westchester County Hazard Mitigation Plan Update. It may sound familiar to you because we just uh, finalized our, our last version of it a couple of years ago, a little late, um, but um, it's time for the update. It's essential that the county and participating municipalities have the plan adopted by the end of the year 
so that we can continue to be eligible for FEMA grant funding. It's also a good exercise in evaluating the various hazards, more specifically environmental hazards that face our communities and to identify potential mitigation actions that we can pursue in the future. So with that, I am going to turn it over to the wonderful Valerie Manastra. So I'm going to give a quick presentation tonight and then just kind of highlight the overall projects that have been sort of identified uh, in the hazard mitigation plan. Valerie, so you're I'm very quiet. To... You're quiet. Oh, I am? Okay. A little bit. Let me try this. How's that? Is that better? Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a presentation. It's a quick presentation. It's a presentation that's actually was um, put together by the county and uh, the consulting firm that was hired to undertake the hazard mitigation plan. They were not able to attend tonight. So I'm going to give the uh, presentation to the town. And then I'm going to touch upon some of the projects that have been identified in the hazard mitigation plan, um, just to sort of bring everybody up to speed as to the individual pieces uh, dealing with the town of Ossini. So with that, I'm going to, uh, if it's all right, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Maybe, I don't know, I just lost everything. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, you can see it, okay. Okay, um, let, me, uh, let me start. Okay, so um, basically um, Westchester County is developing a hazard mitigation plan update. Um, for sure, Westchester County is, this is a, a countywide initiative. It's specifically dealing with hazard mitigation plans. Um, what's a hazard mitigation plan? A mitigation plan is basically, um, it's a sustained action taken to reduce or eliminate a long-term risk to life and property um, from a hazard event. It also includes actions taken to reduce future uh, disaster losses. It's a plan that also wants to increase the overall community resilience. And the bottom line is it's looking to save money in the long run money dealing with money that ends up going to actually try to mitigate um, the issues within the community, but also damages that are done during storms. An adopted hazard mitigation plan actually provides for our eligible FEMA pre-disaster mitigation grants, and it also helps in terms of other additional funding. Um, the other thing, in, just to give you a, an idea of like what we're dealing with um, throughout the area in 2021, FEMA's Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program was providing up to $1 billion in mitigation grant funding. So this really, uh, by the county adopting the hazard mitigation plan and by the town adopting the county's hazard mitigation plan really does uh, enable you to be able to um, seek funding, um, especially for pre-disaster mitigation grants. So, First step in um, any sort of hazard mitigation plan is looking at what the risks are. And so specifically uh, FEMA disaster declaration history in Westchester County, there's been 27 disasters since 1953 and they include all the topics listed here, which is hurricanes, severe storms, flood, snow, um, biological, other, a drought and fire. So the mission of the hazard mitigation plan for Westchester County is really focusing on to protect and enhance the health, safety, property, environment, and economy of the communities within Westchester County, and to increase resilience by partnering and planning to identify and reduce future vulnerability to natural and other emerging hazards in an equitable, proactive, and efficient manner. This mission statement was actually worked on with all the participating communities, and it was one that they, the mission statement started with the mission statement from the prior mitigation plan, and then it was updated to really reflect uh, today's 
um, issues and concerns of Westchester County communities. So the hazard mitigation planning uh, process, basically it's a, it was authorized um, in 2000. Um, it provides an overview of the impacts of the national hazards on, the community, on each community. And so as part of this process, the town of Austin had to look at the disasters that they have encountered over the years, as well as issues that keep rising um, in terms of storms or in terms of other natural hazards, and then identifying ways to reduce those natural hazards, as well as mitigation that could help prevent um, issues from even taking place in the future. And also as part of any hazard mitigation plan, it's a five-year update and it's required to, and you're required to update it every five years to maintain eligibility. So in 2022, the hazards of concern in the um, overall Westchester County um, hazard mitigation plan include earthquake, extreme temperature, flood, severe storm, severe winter storm, wildfire, disease outbreak, chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear incidents. Um, for sure, this particular, all these hazards um, that were identified in the plan, they all went through an analysis for each one of the communities and each community had to identify if they felt any one of these hazards are a particular risk within their community. And so where certain hazards were not considered risks, those were dropped when other ones were brought in. So these, some of these were in the um, the last, the prior plan, and then the, and a few of them have been carried over um, to this plan as well. So the overall adoption process right now, we're in the process of the draft plan sections are being posted and they're up for a 30 day comment period. And then shortly after that, the adoption of this plan will be submitted for review and approval by both New York State and FEMA, and then the adoption of the plan um, by the community is also required for it to be deemed approved by FEMA, and which is really where we're at right now in this particular process. So with that, I just wanted to highlight a couple other things um, in terms of in terms of the hazard mitigation plan, one of the, uh, there's a few projects that have been identified by the town. Um, the first deal with um, specifically, um, excuse me, let me just find it. Uh, yeah, so the first deals with um, severe flood uh, storms. This deals with uh, the water tower overflow mitigation to continue to assist the Village of Austin with needed redesign and new equipment and increased catch basin capacity to address overflow water from, from their water tower. Um, the second uh, also involves flood and severe storm um, hazard risks. And this deals with the implementation and findings and recommendations of the feasibility study, addressing the flood and vulnerability of the boat and canoe club building. The third is also deals with flood and severe um, storms, and this is to build uh, on catch basin mapping efforts and accomplish that through multi jurisdictional grants to the salary. Sorry, the town also intends to develop. Valerie, sorry. Um, I think the, the, the ones that you're reading yes. from are actually the old, the old projects. Are they the old ones? Um, I, I think I apologize. So. I, I, I think this, the suit, the storm, the stormwater one was uh was complete oh yes i apologize i thought that was uh, all right so the first is the warming and cooling centers there we go sorry i apologize um the first is the warming and cooling centers this will be dealing with the town we'll review available facilities that could fit the needs of warming and cooling centers um also the second uh, project is backup power for list stations this specifically deals with the um, lift stations um, that might need to be evaluated, including the Deerfield, um, Fox Hill, Crotonville, North State Road, Parker Vale, and Mystic Point. The next one deals with uh, repetitive loss mitigation. Um, this will deal with actually doing outreach to 10 flood prone property owners and um, providing them information as to mitigation alternatives for those particular repetitive loss issues. Um, you have another project identified as integrating hazard mitigation plan into the overall comprehensive plan. So while we're updating the comprehensive plan, um, 
specifically including additional sustainable and smart growth initiatives um, and recommendations um, for the protection of environmentally sensitive resources. Um, the flood out, well, there's also another project is flood outreach and the administration will provide um, New York State DOT with information on flooding locations within the community um, to try to get DOT to actually to develop some more implementation of mitigation measures. Another one is dealing with boat and canoe club and water for, waterfront climate ad adaptation. And this really specifically dovetails with the Cornell Cooperative uh, Cornell Climate Adaptative, Adaptive Studio and implementing the anticipated actions, um, including um, establishment of natural shorelines and flood protection measures for the Boat and Canoe Club. Another project uh, focused on stormwater piping and replacement. And again, the town will continue uh, with townwide replacement of old uh, stormwater piping um, to also help increase with the stormwater flow. Um, another project is highway department retrofit. Um, this would involve the town to evaluate solutions, including relocation and rebuilding on site, uh, retrofitting the highway office and facility. And then and there's just two more. One is supply con ed with hazardous tree data. This will be um, identifying particular areas of hazardous trees for power lines and having con ed uh, be aware of those situations. And then the last one is permanent housing. The town will work with Westchester County to identify appropriate locations for siting the permanent housing uh, within the region, um, specifically dealing with in terms of um, special flood hazard areas. So that are, are the new projects and I apologize for <laughs> starting off with the I older one. I missed a page of the- <laughs> They look the same. They made the tables look exactly you the know, same. You know, I, I pulled them thinking. up and I was like, and I started reading them and I looked at them before the before our meeting. And as I was, I was <laughs> reading it and I was like, something seems off. So thank you for interrupting me. <laughs> so the, those are the projects that have been identified in the, um, the current hazard mitigation plan for the town of Austin. And we're grateful for all of the input that we got both from Valerie, from also from uh, our highway superintendent, from our building inspector, and um, anybody else. I think Andy and Paul may have also weighed in. So thank you for everybody who participated um, in coming up with those um, important um, hazard mitig mitigation strategies for the town. Um, so I guess I'll just, is that, was that it from you, Valerie? Do you want to, can yes. I open it up to questions from, from the yep. board? Anybody have any questions or? That's a lot of different projects. I mean, I really have to digest it. This is the first I'm hearing of it, so of all these projects. Right, I think I think we shared it, the written document with everybody. I think the, the, the um, county oh. just posted it today. Yeah. I will also just note that some of the actions that are on there, um, you know, either were carryover um, from from the previous plan that had already been adopted. Um, also, some of the actions were put in there that are, you know, required of these types of plans. So, you know, uh, I know Valerie mentioned these repetitive loss properties and, um, you know, some of these other details that were, were required to have noted in there. It's something that was added in by the uh, the county's, county's consultants. And so, um, you know, it just sort of opens up the door for for us to, to explore explore these items and potentially seek grant funding for them. Or in another five years, we may say, project, we, we still need to continue working on this, like we did say for some of the projects from, from the previous iteration of the plan, so. Right, and I think, again, these this is just identify what are the areas that we need to look at and how, you know, and then again, as Victoria mentioned that, you know, this is an opportunity for us to seek funding for these. If we don't identify them, then we don't have that opportunity. Right, so it doesn't obligate the town to undertake any of these projects. What it is, is as you go through the planning process, you, the, the you know, Tetra Tech identified a number of different hazards. The town agreed with those hazards. And then the next step is to, once you identify that these are hazards that are reoccurring within your community or threats to your community, you identify, well, what are the, how do those hazards affect certain areas of your community and what are things that can be done to help mitigate those particular hazards? And so that's where those projects kind of come to fruition. And a lot of it is really a highway engineering, um, those types of projects that get identified by Department of Public Works, you know, um, and also your highway department. Okay. 
Any other questions? Um, one more. Didn't we? I know that it was um, backing up the power for the lift stations. Didn't we put in emergency generators in all of those? Yeah, so um, the that particular action, um, there all, all of our lift stations have backup emergency power, um, at, except for one, um, which is the OBCC. And basically, this this um, this this action identifies that we should continue to evaluate that backup power. So if 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 for whatever reason in the next five years, one of those facilities needs more backup power or needs to have it replaced or whatever it may be, it's identified as an action for us to continue to evaluate that backup power. And should there be an opportunity for us to get some grant funding or some additional support for it, it's identified there. Here's all of our lift stations that um, you know we can, we can further it. So it's not saying that these do not have backup power, it's just evaluating their, their backup power, continuing to monitor it to make sure that it's sufficient because you know these really are, um, you know, when we uh, started this process and we were sharing all these documents with the department heads, I know that that was, um, you know, sort of the, the major concern of, of our highway superintendent is these lift stations. It's one of our biggest, um, I don't want to say weak points, but points that we need to continue to monitor because if something were to go wrong or if we don't do the necessary planning, necessary mitigation, we could be in uh, trouble. These are, considered, like these are considered our critical facilities. Yes, yes, thank do, you. Do, right. do. We don't have a Literally. hospital, we don't have, right, we don't have, right. um, the, oh, you know, we don't, there's other things that we, we don't have, but these are our critical facilities. Yes. Right, okay, and and should the backup generators go, being on this list would give us a grant opportunity through FEMA, yes. is what I'm right. hearing. Right. right, and also, right, and we can, it also gives us an opportunity to make sure that we are, that we have in an ongoing fashion, sufficient power and ge and that the ge generators are serving the purpose that we want them to serve like you know again if the technology changes or you know if there's a way to improve it and make them less vulnerable that's what we want to continue to do okay all right everybody good anybody else any questions board colleagues so I think you have a copy of the town's piece of the hazard mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. So if there's any comments or questions that you have on it, you know, there is a window of opportunity that we can submit uh, revisions um, to the county. And then after that, the, you know, the plan will come to the board for adoption. And just so you know, the, this was an extremely tight time frame from the county. I think yeah. they started in September or something like that. It was very, very... What? Yes, it was. It's yeah, extremely, <laughs> extremely tight time frame from when they started to when they expected everybody to get go through all of these details, get back to them, include it in the draft, recirculate it, and approve it. And um, you know, everybody's just been basically been scrambling to just try to get anything together um, to. Um, you know, there's a lot of we need this tomorrow. <laughs> exactly throughout the process. Yeah. Okay, so uh, unless there's any other questions, hopefully everyone will have a chance to further review. And if you do have any any comments, please um, get get them to us in writing as soon as possible, um, so that we will have an opportunity to adopt um, by resolution the um, the plan in time for the deadline. Okay, uh, Valerie, could you resend that to me or Victoria, just Victoria. so I know I have it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think. Victoria, you sent it out this early. Yeah, this I sent it. I sent it out uh, yesterday afternoon is when we received uh, this the the version of um, this draft with all the information for our our section, um, and then uh, the plan itself, I believe, was posted on the county's website yesterday. So I circulated to the board the link um, at the time I sent the link. I don't think the plan was posted yet, but it should have been posted since uh, yesterday afternoon. Yeah, okay. the, the, this whole this whole project has been very um, well delayed quick. COVID, and then yeah, I don't know why I'm not seeing it. Yeah. Just please, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Valerie, for helping us out with that. We had asked the county to do it, but then I guess they didn't uh, pay to have their consultants uh, go around from uh, municipality to municipality. So thank you for um, participating and you've been involved in the whole process and it's been very helpful. So we appreciate that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And also right. Victoria. <laughs> okay. Yes, um, Victoria did a lot. <laughs> Very much so. Okay, so finally, speaking of Victoria, we're going to wrap up with a presentation of the 2022 budget from our budget director, Victoria Caffarelli. Last week, the town board met in two all day public work sessions to review the budget department by department, line by line. And I'm very proud of the budget we've put together for 2022. Uh, budgets are a moral document, and we've done our hardest and best to prioritize the important goals of making our community more sustainable and equitable, as well as safe and comfortable. In addition to Victoria's presentation tonight, I encourage you to view our work sessions from last week, which were recorded and posted to YouTube. And if you're looking for a good read, the entire budget is posted to our website. Thank you to our department heads, Comptroller Dale Brennan, Deputy Comptroller Liz Nakari, and Victoria Caffarelli, Budget Director, for seamlessly shepherding us through this annual process in a concise and easy to follow way. And that will now be seen in a very concise and easy to follow presentation. Thanks, that's a lot of pressure, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, this is our uh, presentation on the 2022 budget. Um, so first I'm gonna sort of rewind and explain how the budget prep process works here in the town of Austin and for most towns in Westchester County. Our fiscal year runs January 1 through December 31st. Um, we start this process in usually a little late August, uh, early September, where we uh, send uh, request forms to the department heads and we ask them to review their, their individual department budget and make their requests um, to us for the first round of the budget. Um, then the, uh, the team of the town supervisor and the controller, deputy controller and the department heads meet and discuss those requests before the tentative um, budget is filed with the town clerk by October 30th. Um, then that budget has been circulated to the town board. We've met with the town board, um, ad identified a couple of uh, changes to make along the way. And ultimately, the uh, we have to adopt the budget by December 20th, according to uh, state law, I believe. Um, and right now we have that plan for our December 14th legislative session. Okay, um, the town budget has multiple components. First, we have the town general budget, um, which is paid by the taxpayers of the village of Austin, village of Radcliffe Manor, or 90 or so percent of the village of Radcliffe Manor, and the unincorporated area of the town of Austin. Then we have the budget for the unincorporated area, which supports is, is sort of the direct local government for those um, taxpayers who live in that uh, area. Um, and the uh, this covers code enforcement, building code enforcement, planning, zoning, as well as police services and public safety and our highway department for roads. Uh, snow removal, all that good stuff. Um, we also have a number of special districts in the town. We have the Townwide Water Fund. We have the Sewer Fund, which support, supports our sewer infrastructure, our light, fire, and refuse for street lighting, fire protection, and um, refuse collection. We also have the Ambulance um, District, um, which um, is... Uh, paid into by the village of Austin and the unincorporated town. And then we have uh, Dale Cemetery, which is a non-taxing district, but it is a special district in our budget. So big question, when you look at your tax bill, you know, what are we talking about here tonight? Because we get a couple of tax bills throughout the year as taxpayers here in the town of Austin. Um, and it's important to distinguish what we're discussing here. So you have the county, um, you pay your county taxes, which is usually about 10 to 10 to 12% of your overall um, tax burden, your town of Austin taxes, which are less than 3%. So we're talking about a pretty small portion here tonight. Um, your school district um, taxes, which are usually between 60 and 70%. And here in Austin, that also covers uh, your Austin public library. And then your local municipal, municip municipality taxes, which for um, residents in the unincorporated town of Austin, it's a budget that we are discussing here tonight. Um, but also if you live in the village of Austin or the village of Briarcliff, that is your village tax. And so I'm sure our controller can talk, <laughs> direct you to information about the village of Austin budget as well, if you are so interested and you are a village resident. 
Okay, some highlights from, from the 2022 budget. Um, this year, we're looking at a proposed general fund um, expenditures of $5,875,447 um, for the unincorporated funds, which includes um, both the sort of general unincorporated fund, as well as the highway fund of $7,033,106. Um, some important highlights from the budget this year, we're starting with a new contract for our CSCA unit, which is about two thirds of our workforce. Um, this, we're, we're very happy to be starting the year with a, with a settled contract. Um, and this contract is going to, um, it, it is addressing some adjustments on uh, salaries that were identified to be underpaid in comparison to some other municipalities. So we're, we're happy to be, um, you know, providing some of that uh, parity in, in, um, in the titles for, for those who work in the town of Austin here. Um, we've also um, identified a new paid holiday for our staff, which is Juneteenth. We do intend on extending that to our other union uh, workforce uh, that has a contract currently in place. Um, and, uh, you know, we're very excited to be, be doing that uh, starting in 2022, officially actually in the contract this time. Um, we have offered it as a paid holiday for the past two years, but, you know, it's actually in the contract now, which is which is exciting. Um, we are also going to be budgeting for equity and sustainability. I'll talk a little bit more about sustainability when we get to the capital project section. Um, but in terms of equity, um, the town has been a part of the community equity task force and does support that task force with administrative support now through uh, the town's uh, community engagement consultant, um, which has been helpful in sort of shepherding that process along and keeping keeping that um, the equity task force moving and um, also identified some funding in the budget for some education programming uh, next year, as well as uh, funding for to support the new Juneteenth celebration that's now happening annually. Um, we uh, also I included in here so we can kind of look in dollars and cents of what this really means for um, people when they look at their tax bills next year. On average, um, we're looking at a tax bill increase from 2021 to 2022 of about $4 annually for your town general taxes and $80 annually for unincorporated. Um, so, you know, we're happy to be including a lot of these uh, uh, important items at what is hopefully a pretty nominal cost for most of our taxpayers. Okay, so now we're going to dive into the town general, which again is roughly less than 3% of your total tax, um, tax responsibility as a taxpayer here in the town of Austin. Come on. Sorry, I skipped one. Okay, so what do you get for that 3%? Um, you have our town village consolidated court, administration, this town supervisor's office, all the budget work that we do, grant administration, environmental initiatives, tax collection, assessment, town clerk, and elections, senior services, parks, food scrap recycling, rent on the offices that we occupy, and our summer concert series and fireworks. Um, and that roughly comes to uh, about $358 annually for, for, most, for most average homes, homeowners, taxpayers in the town of Austin. And so that's based on this average assessed value for a home in the town general um, jurisdiction, which includes, again, Village of Austin, village, most of the Village of Briarcliff and the unincorporated area. Thing is, okay. Ooh. Um, looking at how this breaks out, um, the largest amount that, or the largest portion of, of the town general budget, as you can see, really are employee benefits. This is an important, important figure here for health insurance and other benefits that we provide to our employees. Um, then you'll see the rest of our departments broken down. Some of them are uh, a very small percentage of the entire, of the, the total budget. So not necessarily highlighted here, but we have our parks at 12%, senior programs at 10%, assessment at 8%, court at 9%. Um, and you, you can see how, how this all breaks out for the town general budget. Okay, moving to the local municipality. So again, tonight we're talking only about the those who live in the unincorporated town and um, are pay into the special districts that I discussed earlier. And so this is about 15 to 25% of the total tax bill if you're living in the unincorporated town of Austin. And 
for that section of the budget, we're looking at public safety, police, recreation, building planning, zoning, engineering, and stormwater, um, and also our environmental advisory committee, some of those services, road maintenance, and other highway department functions, and snow removal. Um, and for, uh, for the average home in the uh, unincorporated area, that's about an average tax bill of $2,236 roughly. Um, we are still um, under our neighbors in the village of Briarcliff and the village of Austin. The average village of Briarcliff um, local tax bill is uh, roughly over $4,000 and village of Austin is roughly $3,600 based upon um, the 2021 tax rate. So again, we're you know very proud to be able to provide a good amount of services for what we hope to be something that is affordable for um, residents and unincorporated town. And how this breaks down the largest share here is for the police services, which is our IMA with the village of Austining. We also have a good chunk for highway maintenance, snow removal of those administrative services. Um, and then again, employee benefits for those who, um, for those of our employees who work in the departments that are included in this budget. Moving on to special districts. So we have our um, sewer district. Uh, you will see that there is a, the North State Road sewer district is zeroed out again this year. Um, this was a district that was uh, responsible for paying off some outstanding indebtedness over the course of a number of years that final bond payment happened in 2020. So the special district sort of dropped off in 2021. It's still sort of included in our, our accounts here, but it's zeroed out. Um, we also have street lighting, fire protection, which is IMAs with the um, village of Austin and village of Briarcliff, depending on where you live in the unincorporated town, refuse collection, and then ambulance services is a special district that serves all of Austin except for uh, residents in the village of Briarcliff Manor. Um, we know something that's, you know, very important and a very important metric for us here in uh, municipal government is the tax cap. So this year in 2022, um, you know, the, the tax cap legislation is that we're entitled to raise levy by 2% or the rate of inflation, whichever is less. For the past couple of years, it's tended to be that inflation is less than 2%, so the tax cap has not been a true 2%. This year, um, with inflation uh, rising, a little bit after as we sort of recover from the pandemic in, in this country, um, the tax cap was at a true 2%. And we also had a growth factor of a little over 1%. Um, we were also entitled to carry over funds that we did not use towards the levy in 2021 to the 2022 budget, budget and that was a little over $52,000. Um, so we're happy to report that again, 11, 11 out of 11 years in the tax cap era, we are under the tax cap. We are also under by a good chunk of money that that we can put towards the 2023 budget of uh, 92, a little over $92,000. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to the capital plan. So this is also included in the 2022 budget. Um, and again, this year we have highlighted a couple of projects that really have a good sustainability focus to continue to um, pay attention to those goals and, and uh, make sure that they are prioritized. Um, we also have a couple of identified projects to help increase access to town services, especially through um, website platforms and things that are hopefully more accessible to more people. Um, and again, every year, something that we, we prioritize and really look at is how we can match grant funds and match projects with funding opportunities. This is really important. We've brought in um, a good amount of grant funding over the next last couple of years. Um, this year, we did start um, engaging a grant writing company, Millennium Strategies, um, and they've been very helpful at amping that up even more than we had been over the past couple of years. So hopefully that will continue into 2022 and we'll be able to um, identify some grant funding opportunities for some of these projects. So first off, with uh, sustainability in mind, we have identified um, two lines in our, our capital plan to um, allocate some funding from our tree bank fund to help for with uh, tree planting um, in our parks. We've also identified um, a project for, um, you know, focusing on invasive species management. You know, this has been 
become very important with the onset of the Ossining Parks Habitat Stewards Program. You see some pictures here of some efforts that they've done in Ryder Park that have been very successful and we wanna make sure they continue to be very successful and can continue to spread throughout um, our other parks and make sure that this is a priority um, throughout our parks so that we can uh, tackle some of these important issues. Um, we have re-upped, this wasn't our capital plan last year, but um, you know we had to prioritize a couple other projects this year. So we've included for next year to replace the ball fields, um, the fences at the ball fields at Gerlach and Ryder Park. Um, they, as you can see from these pictures, and these are somewhat dated pictures, they are from last year. So I'm sure, unfortunately, they've only gotten a little worse, but um, you know we need to make sure that, that these get taken care of. And so we've included it in our capital plan, um, hopefully to complete in 2022. Uh, we also have two, um, well, a couple large grants um, pending that we're hoping to get some good news on in our parks. Um, the first is for uh, Ryder Park, a, a project to, or a grant to help fund a, a drainage and wetlands study in the parks. Um, as we know, that's been uh, a continuing uh, issue at Ryder Park of addressing the waterways and water courses that make their way through the parks. You can even see it here, the, the stream that goes through the ball fields, um, and that th those issues have been um, challenging, as especially as we look to plan improvements at Ryder Park. Um, so we put in a grant application to the New York State Parks Program to, um, to undertake this planning initiative so that we can identify improvements to the park and address um, these these uh, these issues at the same time. At Engle Park, we have a couple of requests into the Westchester County um, or via the Westchester County Community Development Block Grant Program to really relocate the Comfort Station to the to the southern end of the park, closer to um, many of the amenities that um, a lot of families are looking for. The Spray Park, hopefully one day reopening the beach to swimming, um, and we feel this will just be a better suited area for for the park. So um, we are hopeful that we'll learn that we are successful at these grant at re receiving these grant funds, um, and then we would be looking to start implementing some of these projects next year. Um, for highway and sewer, we also have a couple exciting projects identified. Um, first, we included in the highway capital plan um, some amount of money to, uh, to start to continue our efforts to implement the Millwood Austin Go plan with some additional share the road um, signage for, um, for drivers to kind of signal to drivers that there might be bicyclists on the roadways that were identified in the plan as uh, potential routes for, for, for cyclists. Um, we've also identified Tappan Terrace as the next big project for, um, for paving. Um, as I'm sure some of the residents on Morningside Drive will see that's this year it's Morningside Drive. Next year, we've identified Tappan Terrace. Um, we've also identified um, funding for uh, feasibility evaluation for um, potentially a new highway facility, you know, as, as Valerie mentioned earlier with the hazard mitigation plan, you know, we've identified that our, our current facility is, is not quite meeting our needs. And so that's something that we need to continue to um, evaluate carefully and, and, and uh, think about it um, more. So we've identified funding for that. Um, we've also at Although we, we may have to consider relocating or, or renovating our existing facilities, um, there are some immediate needs that need to be taken care of at our highway facility, most notably the roofing. Um, so we did have a roofing consultant come and identify some priority actions that we need to take care of. So we did identify some facility improvements to our current facility as well. Um, we also have a close eye on the American Rescue Plan Act funding that we've received. Um, we discussed this with the town board at town hall meeting a couple of months ago. Um, um, that we may look to allocate some of that American Rescue Plan Act funding to uh, SCADA system for our sewer lift stations, as well as bubblers for our sewer lift stations. These would be um, important additions to make sure our lift stations run smoothly and without issue, um, but we are keeping a close eye on what the ARPA funding can be used for as we await the final um, final rule, or, no, we have the interim final, we're waiting for the final rule from the federal government, and then we can um, make some decisions about that. We did include it in the capital plan. 
Um, some other projects that don't necessarily fit into the parks or highway bucket. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are exploring some new uh, software programs for our building department to make um, that process more accessible to the public. Our current software package that is not uh, you know, a, a system that interacts um, online um, is going to be sunsetting very soon. So we need to look for other solutions. Um, so we are carefully looking at how our other neighbors, our uh, neighboring municipalities are dealing with this change and look to implement new software next year. Um, we've also identified uh, that we'd like to complete an open space preservation plan as sort of a follow-up to the um, comprehensive plan process, which is start starting to wind down. Um, and this seems like a next step to identify how we can um, ensure that uh, the town remains a, a, a place where open space is, is preserved and and cared for um, while also balancing the needs of the community. So what's next? Um, after tonight, uh, we will have our, budget, our, our public hearing on the budget next Tuesday. Um, then we will have, we have another opportunity to discuss any potential revisions at work session on December 7th if they are needed. Um, and then finally, we will look to <coughs> adopt not the 2020 budget, the 2022 budget, where I don't know where that came from, uh, 2022 budget at our uh, December 14th town board meeting. And the budget is now online. And so all this information, if you'd like to learn more, it's available online, or if you have any questions, um, we are easy to find. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Victoria, for taking us through. And uh, again, um, we all had a chance to go in more detail through the budget um, with all of our department heads and the town board. Um, if anybody has um, any questions, town board um, now about any part of the process or anything that's lingering, um, you can let us know. And hearing and seeing no, none, that's great. Um, so uh, we look forward to uh, participation in our public hearing process, and then hopefully we will be able to adopt the budget on time and um, be able to put forth what we think is a very responsible budget um, for, for the town. Grateful to all of the participation from Dale Brennan, our comptroller, Liz Nakari, our uh, assistant comptroller, Victoria Caffrelli, all of our department heads, and everybody who uh, does such a good job um, watching the bottom line every single day and making sure that we are planning thoughtfully for the future. With that, Dale, did you have anything you want to add or Liz? I, I wanna give you guys an opportunity if you had anything. Uh, I just wanna say thank you and Victoria, your presentation and your work throughout this budget has been phenomenal. Thank you, you as well. <laughs> Is that it, anybody else? Liz, you're yeah, good? I, I, oh. I'd just like to say, I, I think as usual, you guys did a great job preparing this. And, and where we get tired of, of listening I don't know how how you manage to do it, but it's done. Because because then again, with with Dale there, what can you what can what can you say? I can't go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and you, Victoria, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, fantastic team, I gotta say, really, really great. Um, so with anybody else? Good. Okay. Well, with that. Without further ado, I would ask for a motion to adjourn to executive session for advice of council, personnel, and contracts. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, so well, thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Yes. Next week, we will be back for a legislative session on Tuesday, November 23rd, which will include our public hearing on the 2022 budget. Have a great week, everyone. I hope to see you out shopping and giving. See you soon. <laughs>